Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that we are yours. That you know us. You love us. And you call us to yourself. So we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to your presence. That you would work in us that which you desire. We are hungry, Lord. Feed us. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you are around church people very long, you will inevitably hear this prayer. It's the cry that comes up from someone who's concerned about someone who's been a member of the church for a long time. Let's call her Maggie. And what will happen is, is that you will hear someone say, Oh Lord, Maggie's not doing very well. But God, Maggie has done so much for you. And then you get the list. All wonderful things that Maggie has done. But the tone of the prayer is around God Maggie's done so much for you so it's time for you to do something for her as if somehow it's quid pro quo you know I give to God so God gives to me and therefore she deserves it and while there is a certain sense of God's justice and reward the thing that happens that God does again and again and again that quite honestly I just love is that he reaches out to people who have no interest in him at all. He breaks through and does amazing things with people who don't in any way deserve it. They don't qualify by any stretch of the imagination. And if you were to look out on a congregation and you'd say, okay, um, who deserves God's blessing today? You would point to a couple of people, I'm sure, and go, well, not them. <laughs> and you see, that's actually the story of who has been classically called the Gerizim demoniac. He wouldn't make it on anybody's you deserve it list. In fact, the story is structured in such a way as to convince the people who are in the audience, who are reading this story, that everything about this man means he is not in any way qualified to, G to receive the miracle that Jesus, in fact, does give him at all. I mean, first of all, we're in Gentile territory. We don't really know the geography of how it was that Jesus got from where he had actually just fed the 5,000 over to across whatever body of water it is and sets foot on land but he's now in Gentile land. We are no longer in Galilee. We are not in Kansas anymore. We're in a whole new place. And who should meet Jesus right at the shoreline was the channel for demonic power in that region, possessed by, if we take the name literally, legion, thousands, that's what the word means, thousands of demons. And what are the manifestations? Well, one, he walks around naked. Jewish law says you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Secondly, where does he live? He lives in the tombs. Oh, that's considered an unclean place. Whenever the Jews would set up their cemeteries, they would be way outside the city because to touch a body was an unclean thing to do. It had to be done, but if you were a part of that and you actually buried the, the body in the ground, which happened the same day, by the way, they didn't have funeral homes, then you were considered ritually unclean and you had to step aside from temple worship for a while until you and purge yourself, clean, you know, bathes, baths and the like, to be clean again to present yourself in front of the temple. So he lives there. Ah, see, that's another strike against him. There's nothing about this man, in other words, that would cause you or me or any, even, even any of the disciples to say, this is the one who deserves 
the mirror. And in fact, this is an aside. Anybody who's been involved in the healing ministry at all always gets those surprises. I don't understand it. And I want you to know, anybody who can explain it doesn't actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> Why God chooses to heal one and not another, I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea. But it happens. God just breaks in and does something. And sometimes it's with the, the visitor who just shows up out of nowhere, who by any stretch of the imagination shouldn't have been treated in the same way as the person who's been there for 25 years. But, you know, there's a parable about that, isn't there, about the workers in the vineyard? You see, God delights in reaching out to the people who don't qualify who are the undeserving, who should have been struck off the list. And what happens is that it happens like lightning. As soon as Jesus steps off the boat and on to dry land, there is this man, the captain of the hosts of the evil one. And man, Jesus is already in warfare mode. He is commanding these demons to leave so that the demons, not the man, the demons cry out through the man, stop tormenting us. They know, you see, that they are in the presence of their superior. In fact, Luke records that the man literally falls down before Jesus, even as he is crying out the demons through him to stop this torment, because Jesus is on the offensive, and he's telling these demons to leave. And it's clear what's going on. It's not just that this is a private, acted out in public, healing miracle for a man. It's much, much bigger than that. Otherwise, you wouldn't have thousands. You're talking about someone who in this story actually represents a, a geographic region captivated by demonic power. And the captains of that army, through this poor, poor, possessed man, have come to confront Jesus because he's now on their territory. We see it, for example, in the name when Jesus says, what is your name? I mean, you can hear it. My name is Legion. He didn't say, the demons didn't say, we're a crowd. It's a military term. In other words, we are flanked for battle. We are ready to do business with you, son of God. <laughs> is Jesus intimidated? Of course not. He's already sp spoken to their captain in the temptation of the wilderness and sort of made short work of his temptations. He, he, he's not exactly threatened by a bunch of demons, even thousands. So he just keeps right at it. And finally, the demons are sort of cornered into negotiation. Oh, don't send us back to the abyss. Um, send us into those pigs over there. Now, this is significant. And the reason it's significant, Sam Wells, who's a New Testament scholar, posits this, that what's going on here is that why there's this huge, and we're talking thousands, because there are thousands of demons, herd, this herd of swine, is because that region was also under the control of Rome. And therefore, what had probably happened is that this village had been, in essence, co-opted by the people who were responsible for feeding the Roman army. And they were re raising this huge group of pigs to feed the Roman soldiers. In other words, they were under the same subjectivity. They were un subjects of Rome, just like their Jews were. So they also were, in an es essence, captives. And a part of the reason they were so frightened by the fact that all of those pigs landed in the ocean was because they were responsible. They were afraid of what was going to happen to them when the Romans came home and understood that their dinner was drowned, of all things. But Jesus is undeterred. It's disturbing to us that the pigs die. And it's not, not just because some of us are concerned about animal rights, but I think it strikes a little bit deeper than that. I think it has to do with Jesus' flagrant disregard for the Romans' possessions. Jesus is far less concerned about material prosperity than we are. 
He's always after saving people. And if material goods need to go, and as a result, he's just not above that. He's got one purpose, and he's got one purpose only. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And who are lost? It's the human race. All of creation is broken, and he's come to redeem it. And therefore, if animals are sacrificed for the good of these people being set free, well, that's the Old Testament tradition, isn't it? He's more than willing for that to happen. And that's what occurs. You see, I, know, I think a part of why this makes us nervous is because we want to follow Jesus and be materially prosperous. That's, in fact, granted to some of us, but certainly not to all. That's why Luther could sing so triumphantly, carefree, but it makes a lot of people nervous. Every time we sing the line, in a mighty fortress is our God, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. <laughs> I've not heard a lot of people in our congregation sing that with a lot of vigor. But you see, that is the attitude of Jesus. That is the attitude of Jesus. And so, go to the pigs. The pigs die. And now the Romans even know that Jesus, the Messiah, showed up. Otherwise, they might not have known. And what happens to the man? Luke lays out this very careful list. Before he was naked, now he's clothed. Before he could not be restrained, screaming and roaring about the graveside. Now he is dastosily sitting at the very feet of Jesus. The very picture of a disciple under the authority of his rabbi. Peaceful. Content. The crowd is astonished and terrified. When Jesus begins to move, there are people who don't like it, and they get nervous. They beg Jesus to leave. What if, when I began the sermon, instead of praying the way I did, I started saying, Jesus, we are here to exalt you today so that if, if there are any unclean spirits present in this room in the body of any people, I take authority over them now in the name of Jesus and I command them to leave. I bet there'd be a lot of people here going, Ooh, what's going to happen now? That would not have been an unchristian thing for me to do, by the way. But you see, there is something about the controlling power of God on the move that threatens our own right that we feel to be in control, to be masters. And a part of what Jesus is very clear about is that we're at his disposal far more than he is at ours. And so, and that's the way, in fact, the story ends. Jesus does leave. But not before he has a private conversation with the man who is now whole and clothed. He wants to get in the boat and follow Jesus. And why do I understand that? I mean, particularly after what's happened in terms of the way his community has received his deliverance. They want the guy to leave. He's facing more ostracism. He was ostracized before. But it will continue because now, oh yeah, I, I know who he is. And so he wants to go. But Jesus says no. Unlike what he says to the Jews when he says to them, don't tell anybody yet. He says to this man, no, go. And tell people what God has done. And he doesn't. In fact, in the Greek, what it says is, is that he doesn't go and have private conversations with people over coffee. The word is, when he spreads the word is, in the Greek is, he preaches. In other words, he's out there. He is in public, talking to others about what has happened to him. He is the epitome of courage and boldness. I love that. And I think it's a principle for us to pay attention to. That if you're willing to say to Jesus, okay, Lord, I... I want to do what you want me to do. 
The thing that should be added to that prayer is, Lord, give me the courage and the boldness to do it. Because what Jesus says to this man is not out of character for the Son of God. His followers all through Acts and the rest of the New Testament are marked by that kind of willingness to stand alone, regardless of what other people think, and to speak with clarity that which they've been given, to do the things that God has called them to do, regardless of whether it's accepted by other people or not. You see, we as a church are in a tough place about this because we want and desire, and I get it, I'm for it as a matter of fact, community, consensus, working together, and a lot of our skills are oriented around building a group into a single purpose and learning how to forge and work together around something. And it's, it's right. There's absolutely nothing wrong. But I actually believe that we tip the balance in the wrong direction so that we are not raising up for ourselves courageous singular leaders who don't need the consensus of others and who are willing to step out anyway because they have been commissioned in the power of God. We don't like actually people like that. Those, they should go to the Assemblies of God, not the Episcopal Church. <laughs> But I want to say to you, we do so to our detriment, that we actually need both. We need bodies of people that are deeply at unity with other, uh, one another in Jesus and can support one another in all kinds of circumstances, both good and bad. A community that loves each other passionately, deeply, and sacrificially. And out of those communities, we need heroes. Courageous leaders who are willing to step out to do the uncommon and the unusual because they have been commissioned by God to do so. And that's the man in this story. See, I think we use community as a way to hide out. And that's wrong. The moral of this story is, are you willing to step out? Is Jesus setting you free to do that? Or are you in a very quiet kind of way wrestling with some of the very fears that are being manifested in the story? You've got these terrors inside. You don't know what to do with them. You're not crying out like the man in the tomb, but they are no less real. Jesus, too, can set you free. And in so doing, he will set you free to do things that you never, ever imagined yourself doing. You see, the freedom Jesus gives is not freedom to finally be free to do what we want. <laughs> it's freedom to go and do what he says. It's freedom from fear so that it becomes freedom for service. That's the transition in the story. And it is freedom indeed. You know a new kind of lightness in your step. There's a kind of joy about you because you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know that he looked out for you when you didn't deserve it at all. In fact, the thread of all these lessons is nothing but mercy. It's Isaiah when God wants to wipe them off the face of the earth for their abominations. And there's this lovely line. No, there's some wine in the grapes still. And God turns and extends mercy. It's the story in Galatians where you've got all these people doing their best to try to be good. And they can't get it together. And goodness is far from them. And what, it, it, they still have this idea, not unlike our prayers from Maggie at the beginning, where the, somehow there's a scale on the table. And if good outweighs bad, then maybe God pays attention to me. You know, the gospel is what Jesus does. He just literally throws the scale off the table. That's not how we relate to him anymore. We are justified in his sight because of his choosing, not because we merit it. That's the entire message of the book of Galatians. And so in that kind of freedom, boldness, courage, being willing to follow his lead, even if it takes us into unfamiliar places. Or worse, it takes us back to the very people that were scared of their rejection. 
Go back to your family, he says to this man. <gasps> that would be the last people some of us would want to talk to. P.S. I said to those being confirmed that confirmation is an act of courage. Because it's saying to God, not just I've learned the material, but I'm willing to do what you want me to do. I'm willing to place my life in your hands. And that's why this sermon closes with the call to courage. Because that's what they are expressing. And that's part and parcel of what it means to be a believer in Jesus. We know we're here by mercy. He loves us not because we deserve it, but because he cares for us so deeply because he made us. We, we, we belong to him. We've been won by his love. And out of that, just like the Gennesarene demoniac, we are being set free and we are learning to say yes. Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, thank you that when there was nothing lovely about us, you saw something new. You broke in. You brought freedom. You gave us Jesus. We are his. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you do promise to never let us go. And that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Father, with such equipment, even though we don't know how to handle it very well, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open the doors of obedience in front of us. And that you would show us, O oh Lord, what it is that you would have us do. Help us, O oh Lord, to live under your command. <coughs> and we thank you that you never forsake those whom you set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.